Hi, everybody. I can only imagine what you must have thought of when we f you first saw these topics or the assignments for today's um, class on psychedelics and the therapeutic potential of psychedelics for, for helping people with addiction, severe anxiety, alcoholism, smoking, end of life, um, fear and depression. But um, I, I hope that as you dug deeper into the article and the two videos, you, you could see why there's, there's a lot of people who are excited about the use of psychedelics to, to treat people who are suffering um, and to get them off of addiction and to, to address long running, really debilitating issues of anxiety and depression. So you know, if you read the article, it starts off with the, um, the author explaining a, a treatment he took of ayahuasca, which is it's only in the Amazon in South America, and it's a hallucinogenic. And I think, I, I don't know for sure, but I've been told it's the most powerful psychedelic um, on the planet. And I would just say, um, before this whole class, I am I am not encouraging you all to ever t to experiment with this at all. I almost feel like some parent part of me has to say, um, I have a certain ambivalence and fear about drugs that it's just maybe it's, it was ingrained in me from uh, in our like our culture does from an early age. And maybe I'm just repeating that back to to you all that it, that was so ingrained in me. But if you actually Google ayahuasca tourism in south america that the, the the danger is not even so much from the ayahuasca it's the it's the it's the minimal regulation of how it's administered there's like a tobacco juice sometimes they give you beforehand and that's not always regulated and there are some accidents and there have been deaths not so much from the drug but just like the remoteness of the places these places this is given in peru it's also given in the united states but there, there's, there's sort of a psychedelic tourism market for people to go to uh, the Amazon in Peru and take this. And so I just, I feel like I would not be a responsible professor if I didn't say, hey, you know, be very, very careful uh, if you ever gave this serious thought. Now, if you were suffering from crippling anxiety and extraordinary alcoholism, um, uh, end of life anxiety, uh, crippling depression, then I, I would be far more supportive of exploring these options because that's the lesson that you learn from today's assignments, that there's real potential in these for people who are suffering horrible quality of life. So just word of warning, word of advice, be cautious. At the same time, the reason I assign this stuff is that there are millions and millions of people who are suffering from pain, from anxiety, from depression, from addiction, and where do they turn to in life often? To other drugs, uh, opioids and heroin and methamphetamine, which are wildly destructive. And alcohol, you might apply the most destructive drug of all time, alcohol. So if there's potential in this, there's, the potential lies in that these could be more effective uh, treatments that aren't destructive. Um, and especially people who have, uh, severe PTSD, uh, war veterans who cannot get any relief. And it's, if you've ever seen documentaries or, or seen the, the thousands and thousands of ex-military uh, members from Iraq and Afghanistan who have seen and experienced things that are beyond our comprehension and whose lives have been damaged by that and have crippling PTSD, these are the people I think that these drugs can really help. And that's something you should be excited about. I'm excited about because there's a certain point in which mainstream pharmaceuticals can't do anything for you, that they're not effective. Um, and maybe organic uh, uh, substitutes could be, the, the, for a lot of people, their last chance. So maybe psychedelics are about to transform mainstream medicine into something amazing. Um, and these are the images um, of, of the brains on a psilocybin and how it can sort of release as, as they say this is really interesting think of it this way you spend your whole life in this body your whole life and because you're always at the center of your experience you become trapped in your own drama your own narrative 
But if you pay close attention, say, in a deep meditation practice, you'll discover that the experience of self is an illusion. Yet the sensation that there's a you separate and apart from the world is very hard to shake. It is though we're wired to see the world this way. And people say that that is where the real breakthrough can come from in these drugs is that that uh, first person view of the world, that the world is always seen through your perspective and you're locked into you at the center of the universe. Well, that's exhausting. You at the center of anything is exhausting. It's like being at the center of a party, just, oh. And so that's where some of these breakthroughs can come um, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, um, is that you have this ego structure. Again, you at the center, you in control, you having to interpret everything through your experience, your narrative, where you're going in life. If you're in your late teens and early 20s, there's just this extraordinary anxiety that can set in, which is, what is my future? Like, what is, the, what is my life going to be? And that can be crippling, as opposed to what is potentially alleged by these drugs is you can get, be released of all of those anxieties and pressures to commandeer the narrative of your life. You can just live your life and be released from all that pressure and anxiety. Now, why is it that this is kind of relatively, quote unquote, new, that we're sort of discovering the therapeutic potential of psycho, psychedelic drugs? Well, it's not just this person, Timothy Leary, but it was everything associated with him in the 1960s, because he was this flamboyant, charismatic, rogue researcher, academic, who was at Harvard in the early 1960s before he was kicked out. And he took these drugs, LSD and mushrooms, and rather than using them in a clinical, safe, therapeutic, medicinal setting, unleashed them and just encouraged young, uh, everybody to turn on, tune in, drop out without proper guides, without medical regulation, without um, standardized settings and, and, and uh, oversight. And I, said, I think the articles and the videos um, correctly state these are powerful psychedelic drugs and they shouldn't be used casually recreationally without it i can almost hear myself saying without adult supervision without medicinal medical therapeutic supervision and he was just he was just of a different persuasion that everybody should be doing this in a recreational but you know for philosophical reasons and it just he just completely freaked the country out freaked out president nixon and as is um, human nature, when you, get a, when you get afraid of something, the safest thing is to just shut it down. And that's what, the, by 1972, that all of this stuff was shut down. So now we're sort of rediscovering it for use in them. Reclaiming LSD for psychotherapy. And then as you watched in the 60 Minutes report, uh, the research done at Johns Hopkins about how people who have this end of life crippling anxiety, crippling fears of death and depression, you know, it's such, it's so encouraging to see people who spent their whole lives crippled by anxiety and fear and clearly have it at the end of life, able to be relieved of all that suffering. I don't see how anybody can watch this and not be happy for people who, who are facing extraordinarily depressing situations. And then Michael Pollan's included in the 60 Minutes, and he's sort of really brought this to uh, large parts of America because he's he's this very well respected uh, writer, mostly on food and agriculture and uh, organic living. And then, as he explains in the segment of sixty minutes, he's also always sort of had like a you know fragile mental health. And he said, I, "Why not just try this?" And he was convinced of, to to try it. And that's the experience he relates. That like you, as you get older and older, you just have you, you know that's still stuck in your ways. Um, allegation about as you get older and there's a certain truth to it like you just get conditioned to have a certain response to anything and but after a while it just becomes confining he argues now see this is where it's interesting because he's not mentally ill he doesn't have crippling anxiety he doesn't have crippling depression he just he's not at the end of his life he does he doesn't he's not uh, addicted to smoking he's not an alcoholic he doesn't really have any huge pressing medis medical or psychiatric problem but for him, it's just maybe to see life in a better way, maybe to get away from all of our selfishness and self-absorption. Um, I'm not saying I, I'm persuaded of that. My instinct is just to just go out and spend a ton of time in nature, 
because I know that I know that the science of nature can bring a lot of euphoria as well. But this is another, you know, this is another way to sort of get out of the trap of being yourself. Um, he writes all about it, and I encourage you. He has a great book about it, which I just, this is it, how to change your mind. But if you don't want to read a book because you don't have time, click on this, and this is his article treatment. He also has one in the, the New Yorker and the New York Times. And you can click on this. This, this is a New Yorker video. I don't know if you can click on it, but you, it's just type this in. And it just walks you through exactly how um, a psilocybin uh, treatment goes and what all the logistics of it are. And it's fascinating. These are all the different, uh, different forms of psychedelic treatment for depression, bipolar disorder, addiction, OCD, uh, cluster headaches, severe anxiety, PTSD. You know, these are, it's just great to have options. If you've ever been in a situation, and I've had loved ones who they, they've pretty much cycled through all the standard, acceptable, FDA approved treatments when you know you get pretty desperate when those things don't work and it's so nice to have some more options just something and then Roland, I, I signed this I, I don't think it's the most dynamic talk you'll ever see on ted but i actually think if this form of treatment is going to be accepted by more and more people it can't be by someone who's dynamic and charismatic like timothy leary you need someone like Roland griffiths who's just sort of very staid thoughtful kind um, but rigorously scientific person to talk about this. It's just, it's more comforting. He, he's got this very Republican outfit on, um, you know, sport jacket. And he just looks like, you know, he looks like your, your pastor. He looks like your professor. And he doesn't have any huge agenda. He's a scientist. And, but, you know, he's motivated by finding things that help people who are suffering. Get rid of smoking. Uh, much longer and more effective uh, cessation through psilocybin. Look at all these different severe depression, mild to moderate depression, right? Um, so the dosage of psilocybin, it brings all levels of depression down, and keeps them. Now, severe depression is severe for a reason, and so it still will kind of creep back up. But it gives you a, enough relief to stabilize you to find something that will actually get you from being suicidal. So, you know, we're always looking for this kind of reduction in symptoms of uh, severe psychiatric dis disorders. Um, it's interesting, uh, this is uh, Thomas Insel is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. And he makes this interesting comment, the NIMH is not opposed to work with psychedelics, but I doubt we would make a major investment. NIMH would need to see a path to development and it would be very difficult to get a pharmaceutical company interested in developing this drug since it cannot be patented. Really interesting angle to this. And this is why uh, psychedelics may not ever really become that big. It's because you can't make a ton of money off of it. They're organic or they're, you know, they're not, they're generic. LS, there's not something that you can make a ton of money off of, which might explain why the drug companies have, tried, have been proponents and supporters of keeping these drugs illegal because they can't sell them. They can't make any money off of them. So, and then you have to ask, also ask yourself, you know, why are things like tobacco and alcohol legal and other drugs illegal when tobacco and alcohol may be the worst things for public health that have ever been permitted by far? Well, if you want the answer to that question, contact any friends you have in Denver, Colorado, because a year ago uh, in Denver became the first city to decriminalize hallucinogenic mushrooms. And uh, so we'll see, we'll see what this, uh, what this shows um, in terms of, is this a good policy and what are the trade-offs and what are the un unintended consequences? But keep an eye on Denver and uh, see what happens with this out there. All right, Take care.